so many of our uh, alumni and graduating students here tonight. This is our first uh, alumni student networking mixer, and we, with this kind of turnout, we hope that it will become something that we do twice a year. So you, you, you uh, have demonstrated that this is perhaps a format that uh, it is good. We have to work on, on the finish day. We want to give alumni and graduating students an opportunity for professional interaction and to provide a network for those seeking career opportunities and those looking to hire the very best people. So part of our plan was, uh, and you may have noticed you don't all have the same color coding on your name tags. So this is part of our uh, identification of you without being you know, completely um, uh, transparent. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you what it means. So those of you who have uh, lavender on your uh, name tags, you have been classified as a consultant, an educational entrepreneur, and uh, working in the private sector. Those of you with the uh, turquoise blue are, are counselors and therapists. Those of you with the... Our higher ed administrators. Those of you with more red, that's what I have, our higher education faculty. Those of you with green, our K-12 administrators. Those of you with uh, a light blue, our K-12 teachers. And those of you with uh, the gold, our students. Now, we, you may have fallen into more than one category, and that traditionally happens, but uh, we, we took the liberty of deciding which category there were multiple we put you in. I want to take a moment to introduce some special guests who are with us tonight. Several members of our Board of Counselors uh, are with us. And first of all, I want to introduce um, uh, the chair of our Board of Counselors, as well as a member of the Board of Trustees, and her husband, and that's Dr. Roger and Barbara Russell. Thank you. Also want to introduce uh, Carol Fox. Where are you, Carol? list of uh, accomplishments is the fact that she is going, she's the president-elect of the USC Alumni Association. I would also like to thank Warren Brent. We were <laughs> noise over here. I'd like to, oh, we all need to thank uh, Brent. He's an alum and on our board of counselors and he generously hosted tonight's event. Thank you. And also hot off the press, and if you read your uh, 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 email blast we sent out this afternoon, is that U.S. News and World Report's uh, annual rankings have come out, and the Rossier School is 22nd, so we're in the top 25 schools of Ed. We're also... Top 10 uh, of schools of ed in private research universities, and our two programs were ranked in the top 10. That's our higher ed program uh, is ranked fifth, and uh, the, the K-12 leadership, K-12 administration is ninth in the country. Oh, wow. feel proud and many of you helped us accomplish this kind of ranking through uh, your being students here and being alone, so thank you. Many of you already know that the USC Rossier School is celebrating a landmark birthday this year. Throughout 2009 and 2010, we will mark our centennial and we will be planning a number of activities that involve our Rossier faculty, staff, students, alum and alumni as well as partners and friends from across the country and the world. It's important to note that while the Rossier School celebrates its centennial birthday this year, we are not your grandmother's school of education. <laughs> so far, the 21st century has been a watershed decade for the school, and we are poised to make even more innovative and impactful contributions. 
And I want to give you three examples. There are many I could give, but I've chosen three tonight. We all know of the persistent shortages for well-prepared teachers in the United States, particularly in urban schools. Last fall, we announced the launch of our unprecedented MAT at USC, the first completely online Master's of Arts in Teaching degree with a California teaching credential and from an elite research university. This program is an innovative partnership with a technology company called Tutor, uh, which is providing the Web 2.0 platform and all the technology support for us. Tutor is the newest company uh, formed by John Katzman, and you might know John's first company, which is Princeton Review, a company he began when he was an undergraduate at Princeton University. Uh, at, at this time, no other university, the caliber of USC, uh, is offering an online degree that combines web-based technology and in-school preparation as well as observations and guided practice. I'm confident that we will enroll and graduate qualified teachers in far greater numbers than uh, we've ever been able to do before uh, in the recent history. Our first cohort is beginning in June, but actually we have a pilot going on right now where we have 24 students who uh, started this Monday. About 60% of them are from California, and the rest are uh, as far from as Florida, Pennsylvania. So we are uh, on our way. In, in June, we launched with 100 students to be in Florida. I also want to tell you about a prize. And a prize is another Rossier School initiative. It stands for Asia Pacific Rim International Study Experience. And a prize is organized to maximize our numerous global activities and build and nurture critical international research and practice partnerships. We now have formal partnerships with universities and school districts in China, uh, and we are developing uh, partnerships with other countries in Asia. We have sent uh, three, four cohorts of students overseas in the last year uh, to visit K-12 schools and universities in China, and we continue to uh, host visiting scholars and K-12 educators from abroad. This August, we are expanding to Vietnam, and we will be taking a delegation of our EDD students to Vietnam. I actually see one of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, from the group that went with me last May, and I see Laura over here. Is there anyone else who's been on one of these trips? There, yes, great. You leave, and, and you, and when did you go? Um, this March. And you went March. So we have, we're trying to send about four times a year cohorts of EDD students and master's students to visit, and PhD students, to visit uh, with counterparts in, in various parts of Asia. Finally, I want, to, want you to know that our school's six-year-old doctorate in education program, from which many of you have graduated and many of you are about to graduate in three weeks, continues to set the standard for other research universities across the country. We launched our innovative program to prepare working professionals to be educational leaders uh, in K-12 and post-secondary institutions six years ago. Since its inception, we have been nationally recognized for our leadership in distinguishing between the EDD as a uh, professional degree and the PhD as a research degree for future faculty members. This past fall, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching hosted a three-day conference on our campus, and so our EDD faculty, current students, and recent alumni could present our model to education faculty from across the country. Uh, uh, this last month, we were also asked to join another national effort uh, with uh, University Council and Administration and the Wallace Foundation to rethink the preparation in university-based programs for high school and uh, middle school teachers. I think you can see how innovation is shaping our school so that the next 100 years will be even more successful than the past 100. It's a wonderful time to be a Trojan and a member of the Rossier family, and I congratulate all of you who are going to be uh, marching, either going to be hooded or going to go through the uh, other commencement activities in three weeks. And we wish you all the best in your career. Tonight's mixer is just one way we want you to keep us informed of what you're doing and where you are going. And we hope that we can provide more networking opportunities like this. Now, it's my privilege to introduce our speaker for tonight. And that is Dr. Rudy Crew. 
Marfa Crew joined the Rossier family in January of this year, coming most recently from his position as superintendent of Miami-Dade County uh, Public Schools. Before that, he was head, among other, he's had numerous experiences. He was head of the, he was the chancellor of schools in New York City. He's a national and international uh, uh, known leader and innovator in the field of public education and is currently advising uh, the Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, as well as President Obama. Rudy is looking to build partnerships that will help the Rossier School engage our own Los Angeles and regional communities in education reform. He's the author of an acclaimed book, Only Connect, which would, Mary, would you pull that up? This is the book. Um, Only Connect, the way to serve our, or the way to save our schools. And if all of you have dropped your business card, I hope in a bowl, which we're going to pass around in case you missed it, we're going to give away five copies of the book at the end of uh, these remarks. It's exciting to have you crew with us as a faculty member at this time and in the Rossier School of Education. And it's a very great pleasure of mine to introduce him to you. Please help me welcome Dr. Rudy Crew. asks us to actually sort of 
start thinking about what are the core sort of bodies of work that we should be in. Not, 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 not the 50 things that we should be doing, but what are the four, maybe five buckets of work that we're going to be in for the next several years. And all of us, whether we're teachers in the school, whether we're alumni and support public education, whether we are uh, administrators in schools, we're going to be in these buckets. So I'd like to kind of devote a little bit of time to, uh, to what I think those buckets are going to be. And then end on, or maybe begin on what I think is maybe an example of where I think we have to all kind of sort of still place our soul. Um, in, in, I don't know, maybe 2001, maybe 2000, when I, I, I those of you who know my background know I worked in New York City with Luis Giuliani. Um, and uh, in the last maybe six or seven months of my tenure as chancellor, um, I, you know, it was just a very rough time. And anybody who you know, chronicled and followed that period of time knows that, you know, life in New York is hard, work in New York is hard, and then work with Rudy Giuliani, there's no description. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then towards the end of my, what I didn't know to be the end of my tenure, but towards the end of my tenure, uh, I, I remembered having this deep uh, um, uh, feeling that I think happens in every educator's life. Uh, which is the feeling of just being so completely exhausted that you've put your shoulder to this wheel morning, noon, and night. You have done the Sisyphean act of trying to push the, the rock uphill. You've, you've, you've done it in public, you've done it in private, and you are exhausted. And I remember being hounded by the press one day and decided I would escape it all by virtue of going to a school. I got in the car and I had my security people take me to a school near my office, which was in bed -Stuy. And I got out of the car, walked into the school, and um, decided I would just walk into any classroom um, and just be with kids. It's what I started my career on, it's what I wanted to feel that day, and I wanted to kind of resonate with the beauty and the power of how young people make sense out of the day that I was struggling with, but for them, it's another day. And I needed a whole different platform of thought. So I walked into this classroom in a school in bed -Stuy. And uh, it was a fourth grade classroom. And a young boy was sitting down at his desk and he was fast with an eraser trying to get an answer right on a, I couldn't tell it was a test at first, but it actually ended up being an assignment in class. And I looked down at him and I said, son, what are you doing? He said, I, I don't understand this, this, this assignment. He said, I can't get it right. And there he was erasing and erasing and erasing. I said, well, did you study? He said, yeah, I, I, I studied. I said, well, did you have homework in this? And did you, did you do homework? He said, yeah, I, I, I did the homework. I said, well, you know, you stay at it, son. You'll get it. You just stay at it. Whereupon I walked around the rest of the classroom. And on my way out of the classroom, he tugged on my suit. He said, who are you anyway? <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said in a very quiet way, I'm uh, the chancellor of New York City Public Schools. And here's this little fourth grade black boy who looked up at me. He said, you must be the man. <laughs> If you, if you need affirmation, if you need to get some sense of your importance or your vulnerability and your smartness in the world, if you want to get put in perspective, respond to me. I remember this like yesterday. I remember straightening up myself. <laughs> And I looked down at him, I said, yeah, I, I, I am the man. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm thinking, that may only be for about another 20 minutes. <laughs> right now, between you and me, I am the man. <laughs> he looked back up at me, he said, are you uh, in charge of all the schools? I said, all of them, son. <laughs> all of them. 
He said, do you like your job? <laughs> I said, son, there are days on which this is a very hard job. And I, but I like it all the time because I get a chance to meet young people like you. He said, are you any good at it? <laughs> True story. I said, you know, some days I'm pretty good at it and other days I really, really am not. And he looked up at me in the most powerful, most beautiful set of eyes I've seen in a child in a long time. And he said, will you stay at it? <laughs> I start there because everything that fourth grade boy needs to be successful in life, he brought to school that day. There was nothing missing from his arsenal. He was engaging, he was thoughtful, he was willing, he was willing to take a risk. He presented himself in a way that suggested that he was willing to commit to whatever the effort had to be to get that math problem right or to figure out what I was doing in this classroom. My contention is that all of us support a school of education and we support a body of work now that has to make itself clear about the assumptions upon which this work is built. And the first assumption is these children are not broken. They bring every single thing they need to Torrance they bring every single thing they need to Hawthorne, to Centennial Valley, to everywhere else it may be. They bring what it takes to actually be a member of this global society. What we now have to do is focus on the other side of the equation. And that is to ask the hard questions of the institution. The institution has to answer these questions. Number one, well, what should these standards be? What is the required body of knowledge? for a young person to be, if you will, globally ready slash competitive. I think that it's fair to say that we do have to start thinking beyond that they have to be academically prepared to take and pass a statewide test. It is not about the test, people. It never has been about the test. It never can be. And those of you who are, who are leading schools, you are not leading environments whose job it is to make a child eligible to pass a test. If that's what you think your job is, Frankly, you have misdefined your whole purpose in that role. This is not about getting children to do well on a test. They will do well on a test when they're taught. And when they're taught at a level of expertise, with a, with, a, with a superior level of expertise, and they're taught in an environment of human caring, and they're taught using the arts, and they're taught using a variety of ways into the human brain, they will learn. This fourth grade boy will get that problem right. He may not love math, that's not my purpose. He may never necessarily become a mathematician, that's not my purpose. My purpose is that he sees himself ultimately as a person who's confident enough that when he hits a problem and he can't figure it out, he actually has enough confidence to try a number of different doors to open, a number of different intellectual pathways by which he can try to figure out that problem and any other that comes up for which he has absolutely no answer initially. So we've got to get outside the bandwidth of just academic preparation. I take it as a, as a matter of fact and as an article of faith that schools are about academic preparation. But it's beyond that. We've got to start defining a whole area of cognition beyond academic preparation. I would argue that there is something called, if you will, civic literacy. There is the idea that I belong to a larger body and that, that my belonging to that comes with a skill set. And that skill set empower, empowers me to be a member, and it actually obligates me to have some, if you will, connective tissue with other people who are part of this connected world as well. Um, there makes no, makes no sense to have a, a world in which we are thinking about trying to have global warming as a topic, as an issue for young people to actually contemplate and know and feel some responsibility for if they don't see themselves as being able to be a part of a civic environment in which they have an obligation. The world is bigger than just you. It is literally a you plus literally hundreds of millions of other people. You have an obligation to them in that world as well. I think beyond civic literacy there is the idea of occupational literacy. The idea that young people in the 21st century world are going to work 
Praise God, they're going to work. They're going to just work. I have four children. I pray that they stay employed. The idea here is that we have to literally provide them with a platform whereby they learn how to work, where they learn the value of work, where they learn that work is both done individually, but it's also largely done in project. And it's also done in group. And that there are standards by which we work. I was in New York um, and a young boy came up to me one day in an elevator and he said to me, Chancellor, I'm going to go to my interview in a few minutes. I said, where is your interview? He said, it's on the sixth floor. He said, but I just want to use the restroom on your floor. I said, I'm on my way in. Come on in. I've got the key. He walked in the restroom, <coughs> finished up, and when he finished up, washed his hands, pulled his shirt out of his pants, sagged his pants, and started down to the sixth floor. And I watched him do this. And I said, where are you, Jason? Where did you say you were going? He said, I'm going to this interview. Chancellor, I, got, I don't want to be late. I said, son, don't worry about being late. Worry about the pants that are, you're behind is hanging out. <laughs> worry about the fact that you're not dressed appropriately. But I tell you, there is no reason a child should go through four years of high school, three years of middle school or junior high, and ultimately finish at the end of those years not knowing proper etiquette of dress. And we have played with this game of our, in our own mind, that we don't want to step on people's culture and we don't want to say things that might in some ways be intimidating or might be culturally insensitive. The truth of the matter is, there is absolutely nothing cultural or acultural about making sure children graduate or walk through a 12th year graduating ceremony knowing that there is a time and a place for sagging pants and then there's a time and a place when there's not for sagging pants. And my God, you cannot have people who run schools get confused with that message for themselves. You can't have teachers who come to school confused about that message. Now these are things that I, in my job, when I said there would be somebody writing from the press and tomorrow I'd have to be worried about the fact that I've got to now have five people in the union and five lawsuits that, are, that I said this. Fortunately now I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> but even if I did, I would say it anyway because we have got to pay attention to the world that needs people who know the right and wrong, if you will, appropriateness of dress that there is an ethos, that there's an ethic, if you will, about the value of knowing the appropriateness of how you look, when you have to dress, in what ways you have to come to work, and so on and so forth. And the last area that I think we have to, beyond academics, and I don't want to lose track of that, but beyond academics, the last area that I think we're going to have to develop a whole new kind of conversation about nationally is, if we really want children to be globally competitive, if we really want to see them merge into the world and be able to sit rightfully at the, at the table of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a multinational economy, then we do have to actually help them have some sense of personal literacy. They have to feel good about themselves. Schooling has to leave children more confident than it was the day before. Confidence is a cornerstone of learning. And we can't forget the fact that there are children who are going to come to us whose first language is not English, who have come from desperate situations in life, who do not come from confident environments. They do not come with confidence in their heart. What they come to school for is to build that confidence. And with that confidence will come the cognition and the learning and the higher standards and the acquisition of uh, their, their, their test scores and so on and so forth. I do not worry about the number of test scores. I really don't. We've raised test scores wherever I've been as a superintendent. It's easy to be able to raise test scores. It's not the issue. The issue is can you instruct children, can you provide a platform for instruction that is at a high enough level that no matter who walks through your door, they will be able to achieve at a much higher level than they did the day before. The three things that I have seen in the best of schools that can do that, number one, is that they actually build human confidence. They build that confidence. It may be in the form of people saying hello. It may be in the form of people being able to learn their language. It may be in the form of people who actually know how to address their families, their communities, build upon the strengths and the values and the purpose of their own family and their own community. But the children feel confident about their capacity to learn. 
And secondly, that there is human caring in the environment. There's evidence that the school cares about children. I've never been in a low-performing school, but that I didn't find some evidence in all cases, just about every single case, of people who cared deeply about their children. They cared deeply. But now caring is not enough. Caring is not helping children or advocating children from learning gerings and partisans. That's not caring. That's, a, that's, that's essentially an insidious kind of racism in some ways. What you do have to do is you do have to literally, beyond human caring, you do have to, in your own classroom, in your own school, you do have to have an entirely wide open array of strategies by which to teach children. And this is what I want to end on. My father was a musician. I grew up in New York City, uh, in Poughkeepsie, New York, where my father played music for a number of years. When he was a musician, it, 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 I, now I, I learned to play the radio. <laughs> but he played for Duke Ellington a number of years as a, when I was very young. My mother died. And when my father sent me um, uh, to school, he always talked to me about the value of knowing music. Now, I didn't connect those dots at this point. One of the things that I learned as I got older was that I had a real ear for jazz. To this day, that is my, my one genre, if you will, that I stay in and love very much. I became a member of the Lincoln uh, Jazz Center board in New York City. Wynn Marsalis is the musical director there. Wynn and I became very close friends. He invited, he invited me one night to a concert where all of the musical arrangement was around Duke Ellington. I walked in, they played a number of sets, they gave me a bunch of things that my father had played on and so on and so forth, and Leslie Young Jr. for those of you who are jazz aficionados. And I remembered uh, saying to Wynton, Wynton, you know, let, let me meet some members of the band. So we did. At the break, I got up, I got to meet the members of the band. When I got to meet them, this was backstage, they said to me, uh, son, what, 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 what do you do? I said, well, I run the school system. I said, well, tell me. I asked them, I said, tell me, do you get bored doing this every night? It's the same set every single night. Do you, do you get bored doing the same thing? And there's this older black man who played bass. He had a hand about the size of this. And he, and, I, and he said to me, he said, son, I, I don't get bored. We don't get bored up here at all. He said, let me explain to you what we do. I said, well, tell me. He said, well, the first thing is, he said, you'll notice that what we pay attention to is we pay attention to the various sections of the audience who are in various stages of their appreciation of the music. He said, there may be people who are finger popping, and we play to that. So there may be people who are just grooving and head nodding with the night, and we play to that. He said, then there are people who are toe tapping, and we play to that. He said, then there are some people just falling asleep. <laughs> so the thing about it is that every single night we play, we play to an audience that is organic. And it moves and changes, and it has its own. It's different Monday than it is by Friday. And we might extend the percussion section some nights to accommodate that. We might extend the, the strings to the section. We might do vocals. Or we might do something very different. But every night it's different. And every song is different. He said to me something that was so powerful and it helped me understand this better as an educator. He said, so our job, really, our job in being able to bring this to an audience is to provide a repertoire by which we actually get even the toe tappers, finger poppers, the head nodders, and even the people who are asleep, we get them all engaged. And it struck me, the best of teachers in the best of schools, no matter how tragic the economic environment of that school may be, the power and the beauty of what's happening in that school is that there is music being played inside the classroom to thousands of children, hundreds of children, who are finger poppers, toe tappers, and their head nodders. And teachers have to develop a repertoire of being able to deliver that. And principals, stop trying 
to interfere in the noise of it. <laughs> Don't get in the way of this noise. Let the noise be. There will be some people who will play off key. There will be people who can't play at all. First year teachers, to be perfectly honest with you, you struggle playing. <laughs> First year principals, you struggle hearing. <laughs> Truth of the matter is, you're all in the orchestra and you have got to figure out how to build a repertoire. And the job of that principal is to help a teacher build this repertoire. So whether it's the fourth grade boy who's trying to learn a math problem, and whose only answer is an eraser, or whether it's in high school, like Crenshaw, that's attempting to actually struggle beyond its own understanding of itself in a context where confidence really, really has to be the bedrock of what's happening for every child every day in every interaction they have with an adult. Or whether it's right here at USC where there are students who are entering the class of whatever for the first time and they're struggling to figure out what their degree program discipline will be and how they'll do their dissertation and on and on and on. You are bringing the same requirements for learning to those acts. The real question will be who will be the relationship, who will be the conductor, who will be the, who will paint the palette, who will paint the, the canvas for you to actually see how to connect these dots for yourself. Where's your repertoire? My hope would be that the work that you're doing both as an alumni association and the work that is happening here at the university overall, and certainly what I would like to contribute to, is the painting of a canvas on which we have thousands of children in urban America who used to not have music, who used to not see schools that had the boldness and the beauty and the pageantry of the arts available to them. <coughs> now having it available to them in the form of teachers who have this wonderful, wonderful array and principals who have this wonderful capacity for being able to build this kind of coloration and this kind of beauty in their own school. The tests, the numbers, the scores, AYP will take care of themselves, give these children more and more and more of what you would want in your own lives. Thank you so much. get bigger than ourselves and 
ask really hard questions of whether or not the policy is working, whether or not we're doing it appropriately, whether or not, we see, whether or not others see us as we see ourselves and vice versa. Um, so being in all three of those phases, I think you don't do them at, one, at any one point, but I do think you do them all as you get older. I'd like to think that by this time, having gone through New York City and, and Miami uh, and several other school districts, Sacramento, Tacoma, Boston, I'd like to think now that I'm in a position where I can pretty much assess where people are and then more importantly be able to help them through each one of those phases. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, it feeds actually right off of what you're saying. Um, I'm a former Crenshaw High teacher, but now I'm an administrator in LAUSD, and we're dealing with dramatic changes in the way we support the things that you were just speaking about. What would you say, as a word of advice, to those of us who are struggling to keep our schools afloat and our, our district moving in the positive direction that it has, given the tremendous challenge that we're facing with laying off thousands of teachers and administrators? Well, I think I would, I would say to you that, again, if I took the framework of the, the, the question that I, I just got finished answering, the work, the work is going to be about these children. You will never, ever be able to take your eye off of that. And the second you take your eye off of that, you aren't at work. The, the second you take your eye off of that, you lose the capacity for reflection because then it becomes about you. And to be perfectly honest with you, it's not about you. It ain't about me. It isn't about leadership per se. It's about a fourth grade boy who's struggling at the long division problem and couldn't get it right. That's what this is about. So, so my first comment would be, you know, stay, stay true to that, to the work. Second, which means, but you, which means by the way, you have to keep the faith. I mean, I signed these books tonight, Keep the Faith. Because to be perfectly honest with you, this is what you will need to get through these, these next seven moments. This is about faith, and I'm not talking about a particular religion now. I'm talking about faith. I can talk about it religiously if you wanted to, but it's not stunning. But, 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 but it, is, it, is, it is appropriate to talk about it from the standpoint of keeping a vigilance on what we said we were about. Um, and the last part of this is that I do think that you, you, you have to be strategic. You have to know when to leverage what you've got as a problem and you can leverage it into a real uh, solution. Uh, all problems that have been presented here in the last several months vis-a-vis -vis budget cutbacks and so on and so forth, all those problems are not necessarily bad. I have, I, if I were still a superintendent, I would be looking at these problems and trying to figure out where is the silver mining in this in this problem. And there are some. There are some. And so we have to actually be willing to look for that and to kind of turn turn the turn the canvas just a tad bit to the angle so you can see a new angle. You can see a fresh new angle. And good leaders know how to do that. They know how to turn the work just enough that you get a new perspective. The artists call that um, uh, a sort of a, um, uh, a change perspective, or I can't remember. I read this in a book at some point, but it was, it was it's, it's really it's really this sort of um, a, 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 you get a different version of the same problem, but you look at it at a different angle. One way of being able to do that, for example, is to ask yourself who else and where else and in what other countries even are they solving this problem differently? So I look, for example, at math instruction in the United States versus math instruction elsewhere in the world. And they have decided in the rest of the world that we are called, we are we are slightly crazy. Right? I mean just the content of mathematics alone and the number of things that we call mathematics, the number of courses that we have called mathematics in one form or another, are is so huge that no teacher could teach this. <laughs> 